Chapter 11, Scrambled Egg. When we come into the classroom, Mr. Daniels makes an announcement. Attention, Fantasticos. We have brand new Fantastico seats. So, find yours and settle in. Jessica is sitting next to Suki and staring at Shay like their separation is a great injustice. It turns out that I'm sitting in the front row next to Keisha, the girl who can bake and write at the same time, while I can't do either. We don't speak all morning, and I can't stop worrying that she doesn't like me. When she finally glances at me, I blurt out, I don't mind being your friend. Keisha looks annoyed. You don't have to do me any favors. No, I say, trying to undo what I didn't mean to say. I just mean, and then I stop, because I don't know what I meant, and I'm nervous and embarrassed, and that is never good when I'm trying to say something. Every word is another shovel full of dirt from the hole I've dug for myself. So I figure my best bet is just to shut my mouth. But the silence gets too long and too loud, so I try to think of something to say. I always knew what to say to my grandpa, and he always knew what to say to me. I wish he were here to whisper in my ear. And then I think of Alice and how she argued with Humpty Dumpty about using the right words. I turn to Keisha and blurt out, Do you like eggs? Eggs? She asks. Oh no, she thinks I'm a barrel full of crazy, but I keep going because sometimes my tongue goes on without my say-so. Yeah, I love eggs. eggs. Scrambled eggs, fried eggs, poached on toast, and boiled eggs. I love peeling the shell off a boiled egg, don't you? I even like egg salad, which my brother won't eat even if someone holds him down. Her eyes scrunch up, reminding me of an angry caterpillar. That's incredibly interesting. Then she searches inside her desk for something. I know this move. It's a polite way of ignoring me. People do it a lot. Finally, I just put my head down. Grandpa used to say that Alice in Wonderland falling down the rabbit hole was just like real life. I didn't used to understand what he meant, but I do now. There can't be any place on the planet scarier than a school cafeteria. I hold my tray so tight my fingers hurt. I hear, hey, Allie. It's Shay. She's standing with Jessica and a few others. Yeah, I ask. Do you want to sit with us for lunch? Of course I don't want to sit with them, but I'm tired of sitting alone and having everyone else see me sit alone. Besides that, Shay and Jessica and some other girls all have these woven friendship bracelets, and I've never had those kind of friends who make matching bracelets, but I've always wanted them. It's like the bracelet tells the world that the person wearing it has someone who cares about them. Not like a family member that has to care, but someone who just likes you. I want to feel part of something, anything, I guess. Shay is overly happy that I've said yes. I sit down after glancing at the seat to make sure I won't be sitting in a pool of glue. Shay motions me to sit next to her. She and Jessica smile that smile that on the outside seems fine, but your gut tells you to be careful. There are a few other girls. Max is there with another boy. Jessica points at Albert and they start laughing. I look over and don't see anything funny. Can you believe it? Shay says. How pathetic is that? Hey, Albert, she calls. Is that supposed to be a fashion statement? I still don't get it. He's wearing his usual flint shirt and jeans. Why are they so worked up now? Shay hits me on the side of the arm and points down at his feet. The back of his sneakers have been cut out. Shay calls him over and he comes. I don't know why everyone does what she says, even me, today anyway. What's the matter, she asks him. Don't you have any money for shoes? Quite the contrary, Albert begins, but given the choice of buying new sneakers that I will outgrow in three months or a chemistry set that I can use for an undefined amount of time, this seemed to be the clear choice. They're in fine shape except for being just a little short. Did you hear that, Shay says. He chopped the back of his shoes off like slippers. Jessica adds, next he'll be wearing a robe. Shay turns to her, I think a robe would be cool. We should wear them tomorrow. Yeah, that would be cool, Jessica says. Shay laughs, but I don't think Jessica knows Shay isn't laughing because of the robes. I think Shay said something dumb to see if Jessica would go along. Sometimes I think Jessica would follow Shay out of an airplane without a parachute. Then Shay turns to me. Well, Allie, she asks, what do you think of wearing robes tomorrow? I tell her, I'd like to tell her that it's dumb, but I say, not my thing. Is that so? Well, what do you think of Albert and his slippers? I feel like I'm one of those old in one of those old detective movies that Grandpa loved, in a cramped small room under a bright light being asked a question I don't want to answer. The thought to stick up for him goes through my head, but it doesn't seem like the right answer for Shay. They're pretty dopey, I say. What a weirdo, huh? I've made Shay happy. 
but I feel terrible. And I know I'm going to feel even worse when the shade comes down over Albert's face when he starts to look sad. But that never comes. He just stands there eating Doritos, studying us like we're lab mice. I think it's curious that you worry about what I have on my feet when the three of you are wearing red shirts. Not a wise color. Red's the color of stoplights and signs, bad wounds, warning lights, and the most severe of sunburns. It represents red alerts and high fevers. Red numbers show a loss in accounting. Red represents danger. I think of all the red marks that cover my paper from teachers and how I hate getting them back. Jessica laughs the loudest. What a weirdo, Albert. Furthermore, he says, any crew member of our star of Star Trek Starship Enterprise who wears a red shirt never appears in another episode. Frankly, I don't think you've made a good choice. They all burst out into loud laughter. Albert, Max says, it's only a TV show, dude, and not a very good one either. Albert's arm stopped dead on the way to his mouth with another Dorito. Not a very good one? Albert, Shay says, leaning forward a bit. You go right ahead and ignore what you like, but it's the rest of us who suffer. We have to look at you. Actually, he says, I don't take my appearance, appearance lightly. I take you lightly. And with that, he turns and is gone before she can pull out some other mean thing. And I wish I was more like Albert. Seeing him shuffle away in those sneakers makes me want to be better. I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not mean. Then my heart sinks because I realize I just was. I guess I did it because I was lonely. Now I know that there's are worse things than being lonely. Chapter 12. What's your problem, Albert? Light from the hallway pours into my room as my mom opens the door. Hey, honey. Okay. I came in to check on you. You seem very quiet at dinner tonight. Something going on? Mean kids at school. Oh, Allie Bug, I'm sorry you had to put up with that. What happened? Well, the kids who were mean? Yeah. I was kind of one of them. Oh, she says with a sigh. I'm surprised by that, Allie. Tell me what happened. Those girls that came into Peterson's that time, well, they asked me to have lunch with them. So I sat with them at their table, but they started being mean to this kid named Albert about his clothes. I look up to her in the eyes. And I went along with it, and I feel bad. My mom brushes my forehead with her fingertips. You're not a little girl anymore, Allie, so it's not too soon to decide what kind of person you want to be. Of course, I know what kind of person you are, and I love you for it. She kisses me on the forehead. You made a mistake, and everyone does. Just do your best to make it right, and that's all. The words I'm sorry are powerful ones. Yeah, okay. I'll make it right with him. That's my girl, she said, kissing my forehead one more time before leaving. The next morning at school, I am wondering how I can make things right with Albert. I'm drawing a pigeon wedding in my sketchbook. I don't know that Keisha's standing behind me. You drew that? I moved my arm to cover it. Why would you cover it? If I could draw like that, I'd put a commercial on TV about it. Thanks, I mumble. I don't know why I'm embarrassed, but I am. Keisha sits in her chair as I stare at her head full of thin braids, thinking it must have taken three days to do all that. So beautiful. I just love it. Not like my boring hair that just hangs there. I reach out to touch her hair. She turns towards me all of a sudden. What are you doing? Oh, uh, I I'm sorry. There was a mosquito. Sometimes I can't believe the things I do. It's like my arm has its own brain. Uh-huh, Keisha says. Just then, Albert walks in and he looks upset. I want to be able to tell my mom that I made things right with him, so I go over. Albert, are you okay? I ask, wondering if he'll tell me to strap myself to a rocket and light the fuse. I have a problem. I'm sorry about the cafeteria thing, I blurt out. His eyebrows rise. That didn't bother me. No need to apologize. It didn't bother you to have a table full of people making fun of you? You're kidding. Why would I be kidding? Can it be that he really doesn't care what people think of him? We just stare at each other. If that didn't bother him at all, and this new problem really does, then it must be really bad. Maybe it has to do with the bruises he has all the time. Can I help? I ask. No offense, but I don't really think so. Okay, I mumble. It's just, it's a problem that I can't get out of my head. I feel like I won't be able to relax until I find an answer. Do you want to talk about it? I know sometimes when I have a problem, I talk it out with my brother or mom. Even if I don't find an answer, I usually feel better that way. 
Well, I wait. I've just been wondering, if an insect is flying inside a moving train car, is it traveling faster than the train itself? And if the insect flies in the opposite direction the train is moving, is it then traveling more slowly than the train? Obviously, if the fly is on the wall, it moves at the same speed, as long as it isn't walking. But the movement within movement is a puzzle to me. Oh. He turns to me, a little intense. You can see the problem here. He doesn't ask. He tells. I know he doesn't really think I can help. Who knows if I could probably figure out the science part of what he's talking about. But my mind shows me that insect in the train car. It's a dragonfly with brilliant greenish-blue wings and tiny goggles over its eyes. The car is old with dark wood and green, dark green curtains, like from Grandpa's Westerns, and the people have old-fashioned clothes. I see them like they're there with me now. Some of the men are sleeping. One of them is waving the dragonfly off with a newspaper, not even noticing its tiny goggles. Ladies with the most beautiful dresses sit in there, too. And I see a girl who's with her mother, and her mother keeps asking if the girl keeps asking the girl if she's enjoying the ride, and the girl keeps saying yes, being sure to have a happy sounding voice. I don't know everything about that girl, but I do know that she has a lot more to worry about than an insect on a train. She doesn't fit in. She's all dressed up in fancy clothes and has to pretend to be someone she's not. She wants to muck around, help build fences. She wants to ride a horse the real way, not side saddle like her mother insists. When I come back from my mind movie, Albert has already walked away, but I don't care. I can't help thinking about the girl on the train and how she feels. Like she wants to do so much, but she's held back, and it makes her feel heavy and angry. Like she's dragging a concrete block around all the time. I'd like to help break her free from that. Chapter 13, Trouble with Flowers. It's the night of the holiday concert when we sing about Santa and dreidels and Kwanzaa. The best part is getting a new dress. I stand in front of a mirror looking at my dress and my first shoes with a heel on them, thinking about the shopping day I had with my mom. We even went to A.C. Peterson's for lunch. I like how she stayed with me in a booth if, instead of having to go wait on other people. I love to sing, but I don't like our music teacher, Mrs. Muldoon. Max calls her Minefield Muldoon because you can never quite tell when she'll blow up over something. Oliver calls, Oliver calls her that too, but he acts it out by leaping into the air and yelling, Muldoon! as he lands on the floor and rolls. He doesn't stop, though. He goes from a roll right to his feet again, like a cat in a cartoon. Shay's making fun of Albert because his clothes don't fit. What's with the pants, Albert, she says. Did you get that outfit in the third grade? Keisha whips around fast. Why do you always try to pull people down, she asks. Because some people deserve it, that's why, Shay answers. Deserve to be pulled down? Really? Keisha asks. Albert straightens his tie, which is the only part of his outfit that fits. He's even wearing his sneakers with the backs cut out. You know, he says logically, if a person was to pull down another, it would mean that he or she is already below that person. Keisha lets out a laugh so loud that Mrs. Muldoon shoots her a look. Keisha covers her mouth and tries to squelch the sound. That is perfect, Albert. Man, you really are a smart dude. She turns to Shay. You, on the other hand, are so low you could play tennis against the curb. Shay's eyes narrow, but before she can say anything, Mrs. Muldoon appears and tells us to line up. For the spring concert last year, before I had a growth spurt, I had to stand in the front row. I liked when Travis called me a dime among pennies. But this year, I had to stand the, toward the back of the line with the taller kids right next to Keisha. I look over at her. I love how she stuck up for Albert. She had all the guts I didn't in the cafeteria. I wish I could be braver. We all stand waiting to file into the auditorium. Oh, Mrs. Muldoon, I love your dress, Shay says. Mrs. Muldoon lights up like a bulb. Why, thank you, Shay. Your parents have raised such a nice young lady. Oh, thank you very much, Mrs. Muldoon. Shay smiles, but when she turns towards Jessica, she rolls her eyes. And she keeps glaring at Keisha. I decide I won't think about how mad she makes me, and I'll think instead about all the girls that get to carry a bouquet of flowers. That's the good news. The bad news is they've been donated by Jessica's father, the florist. It's nice of him, but Jessica hasn't stopped bragging about it. Mrs. Muldoon walks down the line, handing out the most beautiful bouquets I've ever seen, like the ones a bride's carry. Dark red ribbons that wind around the stem like a barbershop light pole. Ribbons dangle from the bottom, too. She hands my bunch to me, and I think 
I smile, thinking of how much my mom will love to see me with them. Keisha leans in to smell them and runs her hands over the top of the flowers. Then one of the white buds falls off and bounces on the top of her, bo her shiny black shoe. Mrs. Muldoon is there in a second. What do you think you're doing? I just... Mrs. Muldoon grabs the flowers from Keisha's hand. Keisha looks up. No, please don't. I didn't mean to. These flowers are a gift, and if that's how you're going to treat them, with a complete laugh of respect and gratitude, then you, Keisha Almond, will be the only girl without flowers. But Mrs. Muldoon, Keisha says, I really didn't. Mrs. Muldoon holds up her hands like she's stopping traffic. I don't want to hear it. You will have no flowers, and perhaps you'll remember in the future how a lady behaves. See, Shay says to Jessica, people do get what they deserve. I stand behind Keisha, but I wish I could see her face. I wait for her to say something back, but Keisha doesn't say anything. Although I can't see her cry, I hear her sniff and see her brush her cheek with her fingertip. And I watch a mind movie of me being the only girl without flowers marching in to see all of the parents and the look on my mom's face. How she'd be the only sad parent in the sea of smiling ones, and how I'd feel like I was less than everyone. No one should ever feel that way. I feel my fingertips dig into the center of my bouquet to separate the thick stems. It takes some twisting to work half of the flowers out of the fancy ribbon, but I put some muscle into it. Stems crack and leaves and petals fall, spinning in the air, landing all around my shiny new shoes. Mrs. Muldoon has turned around to stare. Her mouth is open wide for a bird to build a nest in. I hold her gaze as I hand half of the flowers to Keisha. Well, she can have some of mine then. In the end, neither of us had flowers when we walked into the auditorium, but we had bigger smiles than anyone else. Chapter 14, Boxed In and Boxed Out. Okay, my Fantasticos, as you know, today is Fantastico Friday, and we are going to end our day with a challenge. I'm going to break you up into groups. Each group will be given a shoebox wrapped in elastic bands, which you will not remove, with a mystery object inside. Your job is to guess what the mystery object is. You can do anything to the box to figure out ex what it is except to open it. There are four numbered boxes that will rotate from group to group. You have 10 minutes with each box to so be sure to write down your guesses. At the end, we'll open them to see what each object is. It claps once loudly. Any questions? Everybody looks excited. Most glance around the room probably hoping that they will be with Albert. He gets every answer right. But I end up with the group of Max, Suki, Oliver, and Jessica. I briefly consider going to the nurse, especially when I have to stare at all of Jessica's friendship bracelets. I wonder if each bracelet is from a different friend. I glance down at my own empty wrist. Box number one is dropped on our table. Oliver grabs it and shakes it hard. Jessica folds her arms and rolls her eyes, her response to anything not done by her or Shay. I look across the room. Shay's in a group with Albert. She's holding the box and talking. What a surprise. Yeah, Max says, taking the box from Oliver. My turn. I'm surprised when Suki speaks up first. Oliver, we all need a turn, so we must plan. Ten minutes and five of us. Two minutes each. I think about the nurse again. I could lie on that comfortable bed and think. I've come up with some of my best sketchbook ideas pretending to be sick down there. Max has been shaking the box. He throws it into the air once and catches it. Whatever's inside is heavy, he says. Oliver says, maybe it's a kangaroo. Jessica looks at him in disgust. Oliver shrinks. I was just kidding, he mumbles. This makes me mad. Max hands it to Jessica, who gives it a little shake and says, I think it's a wooden block, like maybe one of those alphabet blocks. When will it be my turn again, Oliver asks. Suki is taking some kind of notes or something. Looking up at the clock, she says, Oliver, you have 25 seconds of your time left only. Oliver takes the box back and sniffs it and tries to hear something with pressing his ear to the top. Mr. Daniels calls from the other side of the room. I love that, Oliver. Creative investigation. While I wait for my turn, I wonder why Oliver smells like graham crackers. Finally, I get the box and put my ear up to it and tilt it. Whatever's inside rolls rather than slides. It must be round, and Max is right about it being heavy. I tilt it again with my palm on the side of the box. I think it's baseball, I say, handing it to Jessica. She does the same test and surprises me by saying, I agree, feels like a baseball. Wait, I say, taking it back. I tilt it again quickly, and the object hits the end hard and then lightly. 
It bounces, I say. Would a baseball bounce? I ask, turning to Max. No, I don't think so. Maybe it's rubber, like a lacrosse ball. After Sookie tests the box, she writes down our answer. Then we get the second box. The second item slides rather than rolls. I can tell because it doesn't move if the box is tilted a little bit, but once tilted more, we'll move all at once. And I can feel it scraping along the bottom. It's weird, but I can almost see it. It's heavier than an alphabet block, but I think it's a shape with all flat sides. Oliver tells me it's cool I'm so good at this. I forget to say thank you because I'm shocked. But then I also forget to be nervous, talking to everyone and feeling like, like I can do this as well as everyone else and it is the best. It's the best feeling ever. Sookie hands me the box. Your turn to go first. The third box is harder, but I'm guessing it's the shape of a magic marker, but much bigger and heavier, as all the sides one way, as it slides one way and rolls another. I glance over at Albert, who's listening to Shay talk again. Keish is doing the talking in her group, but she's making everyone laugh. I wish I knew what they were saying. When Mr. Daniels delivers the fourth box, he stays. While Max tries to figure out what's inside, Jessica constantly compliments him on everything short of breathing. Max tells us he thinks it's something light because it doesn't hit the sides hard. When it's his turn, Oliver looks up at Mr. Daniels. So what do you think there, Oliver? I can see Oliver wants to be right. He tilts and shakes and decides it's a quarter. Mr. Daniel n Daniels nods and pats him on the back. That's an excellent guess, Oliver. Well done. Am I right? Oliver asks. You'll have to wait and see, Mr. Daniel shrugs. Can't you just tell me now? Sorry, buddy. Oliver seems disappointed. Then he looks up at me. Holding out the box, he says, Here, Allie, you're the best at this. Jessica's face looks like if she let out all of that pressure, she'd fly around the air like a rocket to the moon. Allie? Mr. Daniels asks. Huh? Sorry. Sometimes when I think, I forget to talk. He laughs a little. I hold the box in front of me with the long slide almost touching my stomach. I tilt the box front to back and then side to side. It doesn't make any sense. What are you thinking, Allie? He asks. Well, I begin, if I tilt it front to back, the object hits the long sides of the shoe box. But if I tilt it side to side, the object doesn't hit the short sides. In my mind, I see the object must be the size and shape of a magic wand because it moves a lot when tilted in one direction, but not when tilted in the other. What? Oliver asks. It doesn't make sense, I say. I look down at the box and shake it side to side hard. I can't get the object to hit the sides of the box. The more I shake side to side, the more it hits the top and the bottom of the box. Confusing. I look up at Mr. Daniels and his half smile and scrunched eyebrows. Wait a second, would you trick us? What do you mean trick you? I shake it again, tilt it some more. The objects hit some sides, but not all sides. Did you tape it or tie it to something? His eyes widen quick and he smiles. And then he laughs. He laughs loud, bending over and resting his hands on his knees. And the way he swings his head side to side by the time the whole class now is watching him. Wow, Allie Nickerson, that's amazing. I've done this with over a hundred kids and not one in all of those times. Has anyone been able to figure it out? He reaches over and takes the box. Taking the elastic bands off, he opens us to show us what's inside. It's two glue sticks tied together with string, and then the end of the string is taped to the side of the box, leaving the glue sticks hanging in the middle. He comes over and does something a teacher has never done once in my whole life. He high-fives me. <laughs>